me first introduce myself. Uh, I'm Dr. Darren Scott and I am a chiropractic physician. Now before you guys go too crazy, I'm not cracking your back is not going to help your thyroid. All right. Now I know you're sitting there wondering, well why the heck is a chiropractor dealing with thyroid cases? Well we're going to cover quickly today what and why uh, we're trained to do it. I've done additional training. I mean to be quite honest with you, your normal chiropractor won't be handling that. You'll go to him because your back hurts or something like that. But he has been trained in diagnosis and pathology and endocrinology and all that stuff too. And we'll talk about that in a second. The, the education of a chiropractor versus a medical doctor. Uh, we're not saying one is better than the other. I'm just saying that way you get an understanding of the basic understanding. Because a lot of people think you just go and get learn to crack a back and it takes six months and that's it. No, it's, a, it's an eight year program. Um, so it's, it's quite intensive. So anyways. A little, bit, uh, a little bit about me, uh, I've been practicing for 12 years here in the Layton area. I grew up here, I'm actually Canadian, um, I am a naturalized citizen now so I'm, I'm legal, um, but all my family is from Canada but I'm here. I do have four kids, I have an 18 year old daughter that actually, I say this every time, but she drove her car through that window right there about a year and a half ago. I was in the passenger side and I'm telling you that was a lot of fun. She's, she literally just drove right in here and she backed down. She's like, I'm never driving ever again. And uh, but anyway, so that she's 18. I have a 16 year old son that I get to do the whole thing all over again. He's getting his permit like Friday. Uh, and then I have twins that are 13. So, and the reason why I'm really, I do what I do is because um, I change people's lives and I want you to enjoy the life that you have here. The average American lives to be 78 years old. Right? So take your age. I'm 40 years old. Take your age. For me, that's about 1,900 weeks left with my family and all the loved ones in my, uh, that I'm around. And I want to enjoy every moment that I have to its fullest. Doesn't mean I'm going to be partying, but I just want to make sure that your health is one thing that you don't want to mess around with. We get like one shot of this thing, right? We get one chance. And I don't want to blow it. I want to enjoy the time that I have. Because unfortunately, I, I've been doing this long enough and I all the only cases that I see are chronic cases where they've been through, you know, they most of my patients have been to maybe four, five, maybe ten, twelve different doctors and they're coming in and I'm kind of like the last guy, like, well if it doesn't work. Um, so I see a lot of chronic cases like fibromyalgia, thyroid conditions obviously. Uh, we have hormone problems, peripheral neuropathy, irritable bowel syndrome. Uh, when I cover what we covered tonight, you'll, it'll make sense to you why I see all these conditions because if you want to improve your life with what you're dealing with, you're going to have to look at everything. You just can't put your little glasses on and look at one system and just focus on that. Okay. Um, but I just want to make sure that you, uh, you live your life to its fullest and that's because that's what I want for me and my family. Okay. Um, so let's talk real quick about uh, on our, um, what my education is, just briefly, and I don't want to like bore you to death, all right? But practicing for 12 years, I am a member of the American Association of Integrative Medicine. I'm a graduate of the American Functional Neurology Institute. Um, what else we got? Certified in anti-aging ozone therapy, and we have postgraduate studies in functional endocrinology, functional medicine, and functional nutrition. Uh, and that is pretty much our approach when we handle things, okay? So, Let's talk about the education of a chiropractor, just so you have an uh, understanding here before we move on. On the right hand side here is the education of a medical uh, student and the left is a chiropractic student. And the hours kind of go down and the, the course obviously is in the middle. So if you notice up here in anatomy, you know, the chiropractor will get 520 hours in chiropractic, I mean, in anatomy. Physiology, how the body works on the inside, we got 420. Um, we have uh, chemistry, bacteriology, and we have diagnosis. Now we have 370 hours of diagnosis. All right, so there's a thing called differential diagnosis. You may be sitting here and you may have a thyroid condition, right? However, you may have a blood sugar problem that may be associated with your thyroid, or maybe you have some hormone problems or whatever it may be. And so what I'm saying is some of these symptoms will overlap with each other. And so we have to kind of dig deep and find out what is really the underlying cause to your symptoms and not just kind of, you know, oh, it's thyroid automatically, okay? And that's where the differential diagnosis comes in. Uh, neurology, 320 hours. I probably have about another 400 uh, plus hours postgraduate studies with neurology, uh, above and beyond the 320. 
Um, let's see, x-ray, psychology, OBGYN, right? Yes, we have to do OB checks before we graduate from school. Uh, there are some states that you can still do OB checks. In the state of Utah, I don't think we can, nor do I want to, right? We'll let the OBs do that. Um, we have um, orthopedics, 224 hour, uh, 225 hours. Anyway, total hours, 4,485. So what I'm saying to you is this, is we have a foundation education. It takes about eight years to go through that. Um, and so, however, most chiropractors kind of stick around like low back, neck pain. That's kind of what they've decided to do, and that's okay. Uh, we do things quite a bit different, and you'll know really quick. So, all right, so let's talk about the endocrine system really quick. So we do what we call functional endocrinology. Uh, functional endocrinology. I am not a functional, uh, I'm not an endocrinologist. I, like I just told you, I'm a chiropractic physician. But I put this up here because what will happen in the traditional sense of things, in the medical uh, approach, is they seem to take the one system approach, right? So for example, you've got your hypothalamus and pituitary gland up here in your brain, and we'll talk about those in a second. But if you have a pituitary problem, right, you go to a neurologist that'll handle the pituitary issues. Or if you have a, uh, a thyroid problem, you'll go to an endocrinologist. If you have an uh, adrenal problem, you could also go to an uh, endocrinologist. Maybe you have a kidney issues. We, you know, in medicine, they have kidney doctors. You've got some urinary problems or something like that. You'll go to a urologist, right? You see what I'm getting at? So they all have their systems. And if you've kind of been through the, the system before, you know, you'll have one doctor doing one thing, one doctor doing another thing. They don't really kind of talk to each other and just kind of all over the place. All right. Um, so our approach is we have to treat the person, not just the symptom. Uh, you'll notice up here there's adrenal glands. Anyone here ever heard of the, the adrenals before? Okay, so adrenal function is important. How many here are stressed? How many are not stressed? Right? If you're not stressed, I'm coming to move in. Right? Because everybody is stressed. Everyone. If you're married, trust me, you're stressed. I've been married for 18 years. I'm stressed. I love my marriage, but, you know, it's just it's one of those things. If you have kids, you have stress. Uh, Stress could be physical. You know, some people will go and they'll work out too much. They'll work out too hard and they don't give enough time for recovery. And that's a stress to their body. And what happens? That constant stress will prevent them from getting their goals, whether it's weight loss or maybe it's weight gain. Maybe they want to get big. Um, so it could be physical. could be a mental, emotional, whatever. We'll, we'll go in detail with that. But stress, and that's an adrenal gland problem because we're going to talk about cortisol, which is a stress hormone. All right? Okay, so let's get moving on here. So let's talk about what are the th symptoms of thyroid. Now we're gonna go through this list. Now with this list, it's not which one do you have generally. <laughs> it's usually like how many of them do you have and a lot of people will have all of them. So let's talk about fatigue, right? That's a big one, fatigue. Increased weight gain, we'll talk about why you'll have increased weight gain with, uh, with the thyroid problem. Uh, you can have headaches, you can get depression. Almost everyone we work with is on an antidepressant. I mean, almost every single one of them. There are some that aren't, but there's a big, big uh, group of those that are, and I'll tell you why that is too. But constipation, you can have, you can be sensitive to cold, um, poor circulation, muscle cramps, wound doesn't heal very well, um, chronic digestive problems, the hair can fall out, okay? We'll, we'll spend a little bit of time on, on that as well. And the outer one-third of your eyebrows will start to uh, thin out as well, too. That's another sign of a, a thyroid issue. So those are the symptoms. Now, we can also throw up a whole list of symptoms when you have a hormone problem, and it'll be these same things. Or I could do a fibromyalgia workshop, and I'm telling you, my fibromyalgia workshop, guess what the symptom list is? Almost identical to that one. Why? I'm telling you, there are cases that are, truly are fibromyalgia. But a lot of those people, they really are having a thyroid problem and they just don't know it. They have all these symptoms and they're like, okay, here you go. You just have pain all over. Okay, you've got uh, fibromyalgia. Uh, but you'll see, like I said, things kind of overlap on these symptoms. Okay, so let's talk about how your thyroid works. This is where the fun begins. All right. So basically what happens in, uh, with the way your thyroid works, it starts right here with your hypothalamus. Okay, and then from your hypothalamus, which is actually deep in your brain up here, then we go to the 
pituitary gland. And then from the pituitary gland, there's a little like butterfly shape, okay, right here in your thyroid. I mean in your neck and it's your thyroid gland. And then your thyroid produces two different hormones, T4 and T3. Okay, so before I go any further, you're not going to remember everything, okay? Don't try to remember everything, but just try to get the general idea of what we're talking about. And I'm going to kind of cruise through stuff too. And I know you might have questions and whatnot. What I want you to do is just kind of hold the questions to the end and then we can talk about some of them up because there's, there's a ton of information, all right? So here's the thing. T4 and T3 are the two hormones that your, body, that your thyroid produces. So here is what happens. If you have the T4 level goes down in your blood, all right, what will happen is there's a message that comes up here and goes up to your hypothalamus. Because your hypothalamus and your pituitary gland are kind of like the thermostat in your house. If it gets a little cold, that you don't have to go and turn on the heat all the time all manually, right? It just automatically kicks on. You set it at 74 degrees, it will just kick on and turn off when it needs to. That's what the hypothalamus and pituitary gland does. It's your thermostat, right? So the, when this goes down, message comes up to your hypothalamus. The hypothalamus will release a hormone. It's called TRH. Now the name of all these hormones are not that important right now, but just what I want you to know about a hormone is all hormones are chemical messengers. Okay? They're all chemical messengers. Which means it's going to take a message from one place in the body and send it to another part of your body. Right? Think of it as like a little pigeon and you have a little uh, um, message attached to it. That's what hormones do. They turn things on and they turn things off. Okay? So this TRH is a hormone and it's going to come down here to your pituitary gland. And it's going to tell your pituitary gland, alright, you need to release your hormone. And that hormone is TSH. Thyroid stimulating hormone. So guess what that hormone is going to do to your thyroid? If it's stimulate, thyroid stimulating hormone, it's going to? Stimulate. Stimulate, yes, all right. It's going to stimulate your thyroid gland, okay? And what it does, it comes down in these little cells in your thyroid gland, and then there's an enzyme that is released. It's called the thyroid peroxidase enzyme. And this enzyme, what it does is it combines two different things. It combines iodine. Oop, hello. <coughs> Let's try that again. It combines iodine with another hormone called tyrosine. What it does is it combines these two together. When you have four molecules of iodine attached to tyrosine, that hormone is called T4. If you have three molecules of iodine, it's called T3. So that's where the T4, T3 comes into play. And that's where iodine comes into play, right? Because everybody talks about iodine and their thyroid. It's like iodine, thyroid, right? So these are combined together and make these two hormones. Now the majority of the hormone that your thyroid produces cannot be used because it's bound to a protein. So uh, T4, 93% of the hormone that comes out from your thyroid is T4 and 7% is T3. So here's what the kicker is. T4 is, anybody read that? Inactive. It's inactive. So what do you think that means when we say inactive? Non-functional? You're right. It just, it's like, it just sits there. You can't use it. It's just, it's waiting to be activated, right? So. I know you're looking at this going, wait a minute, why in the world does the body produce so much T4 that's inactive that the body can't use? And it can use it, but it just has to be converted later on down the stream. But in this form, T4 cannot be used in that form. Only T3, right? Do you think you can function with 7% of your hormone? Is that the facts? You can't, you can't function on 7%. It's like functioning 7% of your income. Most people can't do it. If you can, that's awesome, right? But your body can't do it. So what has to happen is this. 
There is a bus. It's called a TBG bus, and I got straight A's in art. Okay? Just in case you're wondering. So this bus has seats. This is a double-decker bus here. So what this bus is going to do, it's going to take T4 and T3 and take it to other places in your body. So T4 jump on the bus and take up the seats. Now they're going to take up more seats than your T3 because there's just more of them, right? So this T4 gets transported over to a place called your, your liver. Okay? So the kids get on the bus, they go over to school, which is the liver. And what it does at school or the liver, it converts. The liver changes it from T4 into what they call free T3. Now the thing with this, this is the, that is the most active form of, uh, of hormone is your free T3. So you really have to pull free T3 to really understand what's happening with, your, with the functioning of your thyroid. However, if you guys have had a thyroid problem, you realize that most doctors won't pull that. They pull usually TSH and T4. Okay. So it turns into free T3. Now, what happens from there is this. 60% of that uh, T4 that gets turned into T3 goes directly into the cells of the body. Okay, it just goes right in. All right. Another 20% gets turned into what they call RT3 or reverse T3. This reverse T3 is inactive. The body cannot use RT3. Can't do it. And then you have another 20% that gets turned into what they call T3S and T3AC. And guess what I'm going to say about these guys too? They're inactive. They can't use it. However, with these guys, what can happen, the body will actually send this to another part of your body called your, called your gut. And what happens is your gut will take this T3S and T3AC and it comes over here and it turns it into the active form free T3. However, you have to have a healthy gut to do it. There's an enzyme in here called intestinal uh, sulfatase. And it's only found when you have a healthy gut. When your gut is not healthy, that is not there. And so guess what happens to 20% of your hormone? Gone. 20%. Now, I know some people will look at it and go, yeah, that's cool, doc, but you know what? I'm still good. I'm still good. I got 60% sitting here, so I'm fine. No big deal. Well, consider this. Your thyroid produces about two teaspoons of hormone per year. So now, if you lose 20% and you only got two teaspoons per year, man, if you're making a cake, there's something wrong, right? It's not going to turn out. That recipe just is not it's going to taste bad because it, you don't have a lot of it to begin with. So with this whole system, right? Let's do this. So we have step number one, step number two, three, four, five, and then all the way down in here. Well, let's take it out one further down to your cell. Okay? So this is your cell. And your cell has receptor sites on it. Okay? And you notice these receptor sites have different shapes to them. All right? Because all of your hormone has to come in and they have to dock into your cell. Okay? And it has to be perfect. It's like a lock and a key for this. So your thyroid, your free, if this is your hormone right here, okay? It has to come in here and it has to dock perfectly into that cell. If it's not perfect, it doesn't work. It doesn't do its job. So the hormone comes in here and it finally docks into the cell and now it can download its information. It can now tell the cell what to do. And so what happens is it tells the cell to process protein, carbs, and fat. That's what it tells it to do. So if you have a thyroid problem, right, you don't have enough hormone, for example, doesn't turn this on. 
So you know how we talked earlier about you can have weight gain when you have a thyroid problem. In fact, that's a huge thing. If you're like fatigued and you have excessive weight gain, you can't lose it, the doctor's going to check your thyroid. Because what will happen is you'll, you'll add weight because it's not going to process your fat. And then what happens is your fat actually has estrogen in that will produce from the fat. And so estrogen actually is pro-fat uh, storage, so to speak. And so now you're not going to process fat. Now you have more of it. And now the fat you do have is telling your body to, to store even more fat. So you just get heavier and heavier and heavier, all because it's a hormone problem. And so what do, what do a lot of people do? I do a lot of medical weight loss, right? They come in my workshop and they're looking for the next pill. They're looking for, man, if I can just you know, eat the Hollywood diet, then I'm going to be perfect. Or, you know, I saw the Atkin diet, or I've got the three-hour juice diet, I've got the lemonade diet. You know, there's a million ways to go about it. But if they have a hormone problem, you can diet all you want. You can change what you eat all that you want, but you'll never lose weight. I mean, any thyroid patient will tell you that they can go on like a 500-calorie restricted diet, which you should lose weight, weight when you do that, that they'll actually sometimes gain weight when they do that. Because it's not, it's not necessarily in and of itself what you're putting in your mouth when you have broken things on the inside. Your body is like a watch. You know how you take the back of it off and you have all those little gears in it? If one little gear doesn't work, the watch stops. Same thing with your body. Everything has to work in concert together. So this is step number 10 right here. So this is step 10. So let's go back to say they suspect that you have a, a thyroid problem, right? Remember we're over here, now you have low T4 in the system. Goes through the system and all of a sudden what happens? It gets to the pituitary gland and the pituitary gland goes, oh my goodness, I need to have more TSH. I need more TSH. I need more TSH to stimulate the thyroid to produce its hormone. So now you have a high TSH, which means you have a hypothyroid, right? And so traditionally speaking, the standard of care of, of actually when you treat the thyroid is they give you what? Anybody? They give you a pill. Yeah, synthroid. Right? Level You're right. So they give you a pill, and that synthroid level thyroxine, okay, is synthetic T4. Now from our earlier discussions, T4 is what? Inactive. So, do you think that synthetic T4 is inactive too? Yep, it's T4. T4 is T4, but it's synthetic T4, so it still is inactive. So here's the thing, is this T4 still has to go through the whole system, right? But if you take a pill with, C4, uh, with T4, what does that do to the blood levels of T4? Go up or down? It goes up, right? So it moves your T4 level up. The message comes over here, right? And all of a sudden, the pituitary gland goes, I'm good. It's 74 degrees now. I don't need to be kicked on, so it turns it off. Right? No more TSH. And so now your TSH is normal, right? And then they say, great, we just got your, your TSH back to normal. I just, you're set to go. You're good. And a lot of patients are saying, nope, I'm not good. If my TSH is back to normal, why do I still have symptoms? Why do I still have weight gain? Why am I tired? Why am I having insomnia? Why do I have all these things? Because all that they're doing is treating step three, four, five. That's what they're doing when they're giving you the, the T4. Now, if your problem is three, four, five, you take that Synthroid, level thyroxine, whatever it is, that is the magic pill for you. You take it, all your symptoms go away and you love life and you'll be on it for the rest of your life and you'll want to be on it because you'll feel good. However, you know how often it is 3, 4, 5? Less than 10%. Less than 10% is it really step 3, 4, 5. Now, does it mean that what they're doing is necessarily a bad thing when they're giving you T4? No, because what they're trying to do is they're trying to keep you out of a crisis. Because if your TSH is too high, you need to take some, you need to do something because you'll have a meltdown. I mean, it gets too high, you can die. And so what they're trying to do is they're saying, look, we know when this gets high, 
it becomes a medical emergency. So we need to do all that we can to drop that medical emergency so you can still have symptoms, but you're not going to die from it tomorrow. Does that make sense? So it's not like the approach is bad. It's just it's an emergency, it's an emergency medicine approach, which this traditional healthcare system is super, super good with medical emergency, right? They're the best ones. With crisis care, they are the best in the world. But for chronic cases, not so good, okay? So that's why three, four, five, you're good, but most of the time you're not in there. So what can go wrong in the system that can make this kind of be all fouled up? Well, let's talk about it. Up here in your hypothalamus, there are two hormones called dopamine and serotonin. Now these are your happy, happy chemicals, okay? These will make you feel good, right? You know how many patients are on antidepressants that have a thyroid problem? A lot of them. So what can happen is these two can get out of balance and then your hypothalamus cannot speak to your pituitary gland anymore. So the problem could be right here. So you don't get that communication through it. Now, the other interesting thing with this is this. 99% of all the precursors that are required for dopamine and serotonin are not found in your brain. They're in your gut. In fact, the latest research is like you do have a lot of serotonin and dopamine in your gut than you do in your brain. So you need this to have that functioning properly. Okay? So that's what can go wrong up here. If we come down here, there's a thing called cortisol. All right? Cortisol is produced by your adrenal glands and is a stress hormone. And what cortisol will do is it'll mess up your TSH. Okay? It'll totally just whack it out between your pituitary gland and your TSH. <clears throat> now, cortisol will actually come up here as well and actually mess that up. Just turn it off. Just turn the TV off. And then it's gonna just, it'll not convert T4 into T3. That's a big problem, right? If we can't convert T4 into T3, you're losing 60% right off the bat. And it's all because you have a stress hormone that was activated. Now what could activate it? We don't know, but we can run tests to find out if it is a cortisol problem. Okay, so that's cortisol. Now, how about this? What if the TBG bus does not show up to take the kids to school? Right? The kids are on the parking lot, T4 is sitting there, T3 is all sitting there waiting for the bus and it just doesn't show up. So we know that that is a TBG problem right here with, with your, um, that could be affecting your thyroid, right? Now the other thing that can happen is you can have seats on the bus already taken up. One in particular is estrogen. So estrogen's already taken a seat on the bus and so it goes to pick up the kids, but there's no room on the bus to take them. Now, you have to realize that you guys are getting exposed to estrogen like crazy, right? Uh, have you guys ever had a female profile, you know, about estrogen and progesterone? You guys are familiar with that? Okay, you should have a 40 to 1, 40 parts progesterone to 1 estrogen. Okay, and when you have increased estrogen, not only does it make you want to uh, gain weight, but it can fill the, the seats on the bus. It can give you breast cancer. There's a lot of cancers that are driven by estrogen. In fact, they can diagnose it, that they know that it's driven by estrogen and they can give you some medication to drop that off so, you, so it won't drive it. So this is a big, big deal. How about polycystic ovarian syndrome, PCOS? PCOS is classic. It is the classic uh, imitator of a hypothyroid. You have all the same symptoms of a hypothyroid, but it's really polycystic ovarian syndrome. And it's messing up your hormones. But, you know, people just look at you, oh, fatigue, tiredness, let's run a TSH. No, you're normal. I don't know what's wrong. It's in your head. Here, let me give you medication. Just to give you an idea, I had a patient, this is exactly what happened. She probably spent about $100,000 to $150,000 in testing to find out what was wrong. And she had no idea what was wrong. She kept going to the doctors and they've been running and running tests and they all came back normal. And they'd say, sorry, there's nothing wrong. 
it must be in your head. She's like, no, I know my body. I know my body? There's something wrong. And they're like, no, it's in your head. Here, take an antidepressant. So she did that for a while, and then she, she kept going back. So I just, I know there's something wrong. And eventually they said, you know what, you need counseling. Let's get you a counselor and you can talk it out. And uh, she just was at her wit's end. She heard that we do chronic cases, so she came in and she didn't even know what was wrong. She just said, I, there's something wrong, can you figure it out? And I go, I don't know, let's just see. So we uh, started working with her, ran some tests, and it was very clear what the problem was. It was it was a hundred percent. Out of all those tests that they spent on running, they didn't pull these tests. In the end, she ended up having a condition called Hashimoto's thyroiditis, which is an autoimmune condition. It was causing all her symptoms. So she was like in tears when we first told her. And then she got all mad. She's like, what? I spent the last 10, 15 years of my life, you know what I mean, trying to figure this thing out. I mean, my life was terrible. I mean, she used different language than that. But she goes, it was terrible. And she goes, why, why the heck? Why can I have to come to Lake Utah to figure this out? I mean, you're not the big male clinic. And I go, that's okay. We'll change your life. You fast forward her life three months from that time. She lost over 50 pounds of, uh, of, of weight. Her depression totally w went away. Totally went away. Her fatigue, her tiredness, all of that cleared out. She actually does things for her friends now on what we taught her on what to do to handle her friends and her family and all this stuff to help them through with some of the things that they're going through. You know, so sometimes you just, you got to run the right test to really figure out what's really going on because it can appear to be one thing, but it may be something else. All right, let's go up to your liver here real quick. So liver, what can go wrong in here? We already talked about cortisol. You can actually have decreased selenium. You can have decreased uh, zinc. And you can have increased testosterone. All right, so here's the thing. In, uh, with hair loss for women, it's associated with thyroid cases. Here's part of the reason why that is the case. If you have increased testosterone, what happens is testosterone can come over in here and get right in here into that receptor site. And so when that hormone, right, that thyroid hormone comes to try to bind with that receptor site, it can't get in. Because remember, it's a lock and key. It's got to be perfect. If it's not perfect, it doesn't download the information. And so it prevents it from happening. That alone is a problem, but then it leads to another problem. Now, that is taken up a receptor site. Right, there's only so many on a cell, so now it's taken up a site. Now you have a whole bunch of testosterone taking up all the sites, kind of like taking up all the seats on the bus. And a person can have hair loss and fatigue and all this, excess of weight gain, and, and in some cases, it's really just a hormone problem with the testosterone. So, major factor with the testosterone there. Um, another thing that can happen in here is you can get some plastics. Now, we have plastics all over the place. Water bottles, okay? It actually shows you get, I can't remember the actual number of how much plastic you, you actually ingest because say your water's on the bottle and you drink it in and it actually gets in there. That's why you want to get the certain kind of plastic. Uh, like microwaves, you know, reheating stuff in plastic, it leaches into your food. And these plastics will actually get into the receptor site and do the same thing here. It'll gum that thing up, so now you can't bind to it. And it may be insulin, maybe it's uh, testosterone, maybe it's estrogen, maybe it's progesterone, that it gums up that receptor site, it can't get in. And it's all because you're you know, getting too much plastic in your, in your diet. It could be just a toxicity as well. Um, I know one thing in particular women do a lot, like first thing in the morning, they'll go like this, right? I don't know. If, Maybe it's just my wife, right? She just does this, and it makes you smell good. So you're spraying this directly onto your thyroid gland, and it can actually leach some of the, the chemicals and into your thyroid. And then all of a sudden, finds out the receptor sites, causes some toxicity to problems, and then you have symptoms. Um, your makeups, just to let you know, there's a lot of, if you don't know, there's a lot of estrogen in most of your makeup. It has estrogen in the makeup. Okay, so. With the whole scenario, we look at all 10 steps, okay? Now, to throw more fuel on the fire, after all of this stuff that we just discussed, right? For nine out of 10 people, none of this even applies to them at all because the problem isn't anywhere in there. It's somewhere else. And what it is, it's a condition called 
Hashimoto's. 90% of all cases in the United States are Hashimoto's. Hashimoto's was discovered in 1912, so this isn't like a new thing. It's been around since 1912. A doctor founded it, I, and guess who the doctor was? Dr. Hashimoto, right? And so what Hashimoto's is, let me just erase part of this here. Hashimoto's is an autoimmune condition. And so what happens is your own immune system gets disorganized and confused, and then mistakenly it tags your own tissue for destruction. It thinks it's a foreign invader. All right, so if this is your thyroid gland right here, okay, and then you got your immune system right here, and so what happens is this, is you have like certain triggers that will trigger your immune system off to send up guys to destroy the cells in your thyroid gland. So it keeps destroying the thyroid gland. Hashimoto's will completely eradicate your thyroid. It'll destroy the, the cells in the, in the thyroid. And there's a lot of different triggers that can trigger this immune response off. Now, some of those triggers can be number one, when you first cycle. When you start first menstruating. So this is like a 12 or 13 year old girl that's getting straight A's in class, right? And all of a sudden she has her first period. And then all of a sudden her grades start dropping. She's having some problems. And then everyone's like, ah, he just, she's just into boys now. That's what's wrong. But the cycle could trigger the immune system to come up here and attack your thyroid tissue. Another one can be um, pregnancy. Now generally, kind of odd, is usually it's the second pregnancy. So what happens, you have the first baby, things are cool and great, everything's great, and then all of a sudden, you have the second pregnancy and nothing's the same again. It's like, man, I, I can't lose the weight, I'm tired, I'm whack, I just, there's, I'm just messed up. Okay? So it could be pregnancy. It could be for any of them. It could be your first one, it could be your fourth one, right? But for some reason, we see a lot with that second one. It's that trigger to spike this to attack. You can also have menopause. Now, if you've had a hysterectomy, we call that surgical menopause. It's the same thing, right? it'll trigger that off. Now with menopause, if you, know, if you know anybody, they have hot flashes, okay? And some of you, even I've had uh, people in their 20s and they're having hot flashes. They shouldn't be having hot flashes. What a hot flash is, is a spike in estrogen. That's what it is. And remember that 40 to one? You need that 40 parts progesterone to one estrogen to keep things going. So when they're cycling, these women that have a problem with the female hormones is they'll like have it, they'll have a heavy cycle, they're irritable, they have mood swings, you know, one cycle they're heavy, the next one they won't have one for a month or two. It's all usually down to the estrogen progesterone ratio. And you get those ratios back in line, magic these people just love life again and their husbands and boyfriends or whatever, they love it too because now she's not so moody anymore. Okay? Another one can be food allergies. I'm going to put sensitivities because there's a difference. A food sensitivity uh, like dairy, wheat, soy, uh, you eat these things and it can trigger your immune system to come up here and attack your thyroid. There's one in particular is wheat. So if you get anything from me tonight, if you have a thyroid problem, you probably really need to stay away from wheat. We check our patients to see if they are sensitive to it, but there's a link between wheat and Hashimoto's disease. What they found is actually molecularly, wheat, the wheat molecule looks a whole lot like your thyroid gland. And so you eat it, you know, you got this crazy immune system, it's like, yeah, let's, let's, let's go after this, and then it accidentally goes after your thyroid gland. Okay? So food sensitivities. The list can be super, super long, right? Uh, I just got off the phone from a lady from Salem, right? She's a bodybuilder. And I'm telling you, I, she has, I know she has Hashimoto's. I, I was on the phone for, what, 45 minutes or something. Uh, what, Salem's, what, four hours away or something? I don't know where it is. I don't know where Salem is. But here's the thing. She goes, hey, you know what? Everything was great. I'm a bodybuilder. I went to a bodybuilding competition. Her body weight was 120. She was like 8% body fat. I mean, she's competing. 
I mean, that's, it's not easy to compete at a bodybuilding competition. She's not huge, it's one of those fitness ones. She goes, I went through this, and I did this, and all of a sudden I had this huge belly. She goes, I have this huge belly, and I couldn't get rid of it, and I had all these symptoms. Now I'm so tired, I have all these problems. And I'm telling you, you must have eaten something different. Well, she, she talked that, yeah, I had, I had this different stuff because when you start to do the competition, they tell you to do this little thing. I go, that's probably the trigger that triggered off an immune response. It sounds pretty, because if you're fine and all of a sudden, that's probably what it was. We'll find out, she's coming in. Um, but it could be anything that triggers this response. So now what, here's what happens. You guys ever heard of a goiter, right? So when you have this response and you have this tissue damage that starts attacking that tissue for whatever reason, you have these other cells over here that get bigger and bigger as more cells get destroyed because they're like, oh my goodness, I need help because there's not so many of us around anymore. Now I have to do more work. So it gets bigger. So you can now get a, a goiter or like a nodule. If you get a goiter or a nodule, the thing with these guys, you got to make sure they're not cancerous. Because if they are, you got to rip them out. You, know, you, you don't mess around with it. And then you will be on a hormone forever. So I get this question a lot. Well, if I don't have a thyroid, can you still help me? Absolutely. You know what? They can't rip out every little piece of that thyroid. You know, think of it this way. It's kind of like a, your gum on the bottom of your shoe. You take the gum off. Is there a little bit of gum left on the bottom? That's what happens. So they surgically can't get everything, even when they nuke it. It's pretty tough to get every little thing. Um, and so you still have, you can still work with that. And besides, remember the treatment, if they take out your thyroid gland, you're gonna, they're gonna give you hormone, which is what? T4, which is inactive. That means it's gotta go get a ride on the bus. It's gotta go to the liver. It's gotta be converted. It's gotta go through the whole process. Because if there's something broken in this system in here, even if you're taking the hormone, it ain't gonna make you feel better. That's why a lot of people, honestly, they're on a hormone. They probably need to be on a hormone, but they don't feel better because they have broken parts in the system. Okay? Um, anyway, so basically our approach when we handle this is we look at the inside of here to find out where's the breaks in the system, and then we support those areas. So if you have a gut problem, we fix the gut. If you have a liver problem, we support the liver to help the overall functioning of your hormones and your, your health. So this is like a really quick version of it. So that's our approach. And so what we do is we will change what you eat. We'll modify certain foods. There's another part of your immune system here that's really important. It's called Th1, Th2. And yeah, no problem. What you do is if, if you have the Th1 and Th2 imbalance, you can have a Hashimoto's attack. Or what will happen is that if there are certain foods that you eat that will stimulate that part of the immune system. So for example, TH1s are the assassin cells. They're the ones that kill stuff. The TH2s are the ones that ID what needs to be killed. So if you're like this, you have too many uh, TH1s floating around, what's going to happen? They're just going to kill stuff. It's like those gangbangers that are doing drive-by shootings. They're killing the bad guys, but they're killing good guys at the same time. So how do you correct this? Is you have to stimulate your TH2 to balance it back out. Do you have a question? Yeah. Yeah, what's your question? What, 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 this is the physiological part of it. What would be the um, testings or what do you have to do? Yep, we're gonna talk about that in about two seconds. Okay. Yep. So we have to stimulate one side or the other. There are certain foods, like if you're drinking green tea, you need to probably stop drinking green tea. That could be like gasoline to your fire for your thyroid gland because that'll stimulate your TH2 and that'll throw your immune system way out of balance and then it's gonna mess you up. But we check patients to see if they're imbalanced with their immune system, okay? So, with that said, what do we do? She just led us right in there, good job. So what we do is this, is we will modify what you eat so there's certain foods. We'll tell you what to eat, what not to eat, how often. Um, and then we have to test you, right? We have to find out what's wrong on the inside. So most doctors will pull a TSH and a T4. So right here, they'll pull this, TSH, T4. That's normally what they pull. However, what I pull is quite a bit different, at least with the thyroid panel. I will pull these. This is actually total T4. I'll do a total T3. 
a free T3, a free T4, a TBG, you gotta make sure if the bus is showing up or if the seats are full. Okay, we have an FT, an FTI, we have a TPO antibody and a T, uh, anti-thyroglobulin antibody. These two here tell you if you have Hashimoto's, it's 100%. You run it, you know for 100%. Um, we're also gonna pull a reverse T3, a T3 uptake, well, that's per, sometimes we'll do a, uh, a TSI test. But those are the kind of basic ones. So we can get a full picture of what's happening. Okay. Now, we'll also do a general blood work. We do about eight to nine vials of blood. We want to check your liver. We check your blood sugar. We got to check your hormones. Your, uh, we check everything. Most doctors pull about 15 markers. We pull 85. Okay. Because we want to see everything. Second thing we're going to pull is a saliva test. Because remember this cortisol hormone. Right? Cortisol, the deal with the cortisol is this, and this is like super, super important. Cortisol should be high in the morning. If this is like 8 o'clock, this is 11, this is uh, 4, and let's say this is right before midnight. Okay? So that's 12. Should be high in the morning to give you the energy to function. It should slowly go work out at night so you can go to sleep. Okay? So it should look kind of like this. Now let's say you go in and you get your blood checked. You go to your doctor and he checks your cortisol because you went to this weird chiropractor and he said you have adrenal problems. And he checks at 11 o'clock and you go right there. Okay? And so he goes, you know what, you're normal. You have a normal cortisol. There's nothing wrong with your adrenal glands. Because what's happening is he just tells you you're normal there. What about the 8 o'clock? What about the 11? What about the 4? So let's say you go in and you get your saliva test and you're here you're here, then you're way down here, and then you're about right there. Okay? Usually what I'll tell the patient is like, you're really tired in the morning, you have a hard time getting going, you're tired, you're fatigued, you're, you're doing rock star, you're doing the jump start stuff, the four hour energy. Okay? You get all your work done around 11, and then you crash in the afternoon. Right? And then at night, your cortisol sp uh, spikes, and now you can't sleep. And you think it's just you're thinking about your day, but it's really because your hormones went up and you're like activated because of your hormone. Or you wake up every two or three hours. So that's why we do a saliva test to determine where you are there. Because this is hugely important with thyroid function. We always have to look at your adrenal glands to see because we have to support those along with your thyroid. They go hand in hand. So a saliva test, general blood work, and then we will do the... Um, We'll do sensitivity tests. We'll check to see if you're sensitive to wheat or if you have a leaky gut, uh, those kind of things. We could do stool samples. Uh, there's a lot of testing that we do. And everyone is different, but those are the basic three that we usually start off with. Based on the testing, then we do a, a specific support program, whatever we find, which means you may have a powder, a cream, or a supplement. Now what happens if you ever had your blood work taken, you ever get your lab work and there's like four pages and you're looking at it going, I don't even know what this means? What I do is I want you to understand. And so I'll put in uh, your same blood markers, I'll put it into my database, and then we color code it for you. Make it easy. Green is normal. Yellow is the check engine light. There's something wrong. It's not an emergency yet. Red is it's broken. Even the lab says it's broken. Okay. So you can quickly look at your own blood work and go, yep, I have a problem. And you don't have to know what an AST is, right? But you can see there's something wrong. And with these lab ranges, with your TSH, you may want to write this down. With your TSH here, this is the hormone that they're really exclusively looking at to monitor your thyroid. And only because they want to see how much hormone to give you or not give you. The range for this, where you function at, is 1.8, no higher than 3.0. That's where you should function. However, when you get your lab test from LabCorp or Quest, or whatever your lab is, do you think it has 1.8 to 3 point on it? No. The LabCorp is 0.35 to 4.5. So here's what happens. You go into the lab, you get your your TSA check to see if the, you know you have you have symptoms they want to check your thyroid and you come back and you are at 0.35 all right you're 0.35 are you normal would you say you're normal no you're not right no way are you normal but will the lab say you're normal yeah because you're within their range 
but you're way below 1.8. So it comes back, they say, no, your thyroid's good. But is it? You should be no lower than 1.8. So there's a big gap from emergency range to optimal range. That is like the black hole where people fall in, where they go get their blood work and they're told they're normal and they're not. That's exactly what happened to that uh, one patient I told you about. And we're able to pick it up. And that's what's so wonderful. That's what functional medicine is. We can pick these things up a lot earlier instead of waiting for them to be a major, major crisis. Because that's what that range is. It's the past thousand or thousand patients that went into the lab. And all they do is all those thousand patients that had TSH checked, they throw out the highs, they throw out the low numbers, and they bell curve it. And that's where they get that range. Because the Quest labs does not have that range. Their range is different. Each lab is different. Every single one of them are different. The ranges that we use are based uh, by the Endocrine Society. They're the ones that developed the, the functional ranges. And what they did is they tested healthy people. Because who's getting their blood drawn? Sick people. That's why. So you're comparing your blood work to someone that has stage 4 cancer. And they happen to check your TSH levels. Right? Because that's the problem. So that's what we do with the functional ranges. And that's why this looks the way it does. So when I sit down with the patient, I go through all of their blood work. Okay, so if what I went through with you today made sense to you, if it seems to resonate, right? If you're looking at it going, man, this, this, this feels right. Somebody should have told me this before. I'm telling you, I've done this workshop probably 100 times. And usually what happens with the patient is a light bulb goes on with them. And they go, oh my gosh, finally. And then they're like, oh, why wasn't I told about this earlier? Why doesn't my doctor? That's what they Why did my doctor tell me this? I can't tell you that. I don't know. But if it makes sense to you, what you need to do is you just need to set up an appointment. Okay? Because they say knowledge is power. I'm telling you it isn't. Action is power. I spent an hour explaining this to you. And if you do nothing about it, you might as well not even show up here. However, for me, if you learn something more about your thyroid, that is good enough for me. Because no one else is going to teach you this. I'm telling nobody. All right. So if you want us to take a look at the, your case, this is what happens is there's two visits that we usually offer. The first visit, we sit down with you, we will do a complete neurological exam. Why do I do a neurological exam? The first two steps of your, your thyroid function is in your brain. We need to make sure that's functioning properly. So I do a functional neurological exam. Some people have problems there, some people don't. We will do, we'll get us your blood work. If you have some recent blood work, get it into us and we'll evaluate your blood work. Okay? We'll put it in functional ranges and we'll go through the blood work with you. I'll also go through all your paperwork as well. Some of these forms that you need to fill out, you already have them here. And I'll go through those and what those mean. Here's what these forms mean that you're filling out, the one, twos, and threes. If you've marked a one, a two, or a three on any of that paperwork, you have a problem within that section. And that went through every single system in your body. So we'll discuss that with you and what it, what it means when you, when you come in. Um, we'll cover that. that. So that's basically day one to see if you're in the right place. Day two, we do a report of findings where I sit down with you and I tell you, this is what we found. This is what your blood work says. We accept your case or we don't accept your case. Okay? And we go through it that way. I'm telling you, we accept five cases per month. I'm, we'll probably this month probably have 40 plus people apply for care in our clinic. The reason why we limit the people that we see is because I, cannot see, I can't change your life in 90 seconds. That's the average doctor time with a patient is 90 seconds. It doesn't happen. And I can't make you feel like cattle and we don't want to have 50, 100 people in here. You know, and you're afraid to ask a question because I have 50 people. Now we are busy, right? But that's why we limit it, okay? So if we accept your case, I will tell you how much uh, it's going to cost, how long it's going to be, what, you're, what we have to do, what labs we're going to pull. I do not pull any labs unless I work with you. Okay? Um, and then we'll go from there. That's kind of how that works. Normally those two visits are $350 to do those two visits. What I do is you sat through my workshop. It's $125 if you sign up today to make an appointment. If you pay today, then it's $75. How do you pay about the insurance? Huh? Does the insurance cover it? Okay, we're, we're going to cover that. No, the insurance is not going to cover everything. Okay, so but it's seventy-five dollars for you for the two days. If I cannot help you, we determine we don't think we can help you. I will give you your seventy-five dollars back. Nikki, do have we ever given money back? Yeah, sometimes. Yeah, I always do that because people like they sit there and go, Nah, and they, he helps everyone that walks in. No, we turn away a lot of people. 
all right? And I, I'll be quite honest with you, when you're coming in, you're filling out paperwork, I'm kind of interviewing you because we have to make sure that we want to set you up to be a success, not a failure. You know, there's too many times that people want a life change, but they're not willing to do what it takes. So how much is it going to cost, right? I know that's a question in your mind. I got to tell you, I don't know. Look at all this. It depends on what we have to do with you, right? If you have more things, we have to do more things. Some people have a copay. Some people have a deductible. Some people's insurance covers some labs. Some people's don't cover some labs, right? Now you got Obamacare coming in. It's like nobody knows what the heck's going to go on. So what I'm going to tell you is on your second visit, we will tell you exactly what it's going to cost you, right? Before we do anything, you'll know exactly what it is, and we'll have your insurance verified. Bring your insurance information. Nikki, can't wait to jump on the phone and call your insurance. She loves it. She really hates it. <laughs> but, but she does it so we can find out. We'll try to get as much insurance coverage for you as possible. So last thing, my commitment's for you to schedule an appointment. I have certain conditions. Number one, you got to be willing to make a lifestyle change. If you're not willing to make a lifestyle change, do not make an appointment with me. It just is not. You're going to waste your time. You're going to waste my time. Okay, what that will be will be different for everybody. You just got to be willing to do what it takes. Second thing is if you're expecting your insurance to cover it all, don't set up an appointment either. The days of insurance covering everything is a thing of the past. Trust me, that, that train left a long time ago. Um, if you're looking for emergency care, you crack your face open, you go to emergency room, Ob Obamacare will probably cover it. But I'm telling you, you know what the biggest uh, the, the biggest growing business in Canada is where they have national health care? Private hospitals where it's all cash hospitals. You go in, you pay cash, and that's what's the biggest business right now is that. So what I'm saying to you is you, we don't, your insurance won't cover everything, but if you're sitting there going, man, I, I don't want to come out of pocket for anything, then don't waste my time or yours because there is out-of-pocket expense. How much will just depend? It could be two to $400 per month. But we have plans that fit everywhere where 96% of the people that come in can get the care that they need. And I will work with your financial means. I work with everybody. I will work with you if it's important for you to have your life changed. Right? I will do whatever we can to make sure you can get the care that you need. Uh, last thing. Make sure when you, set, you come for your appointment that you have your paperwork filled out. If you show up without your paperwork filled out, it's a red flag for me. I'm like, well, they don't really care. And we're busy. Because when you schedule at like 9 o'clock, I'm going to walk in at 9.05. You're not going to wait an hour for me. Um, last thing, shorts and t-shirt. Bring that with you. We'll need it. We have gowns if you want a gown, but no, we all know no one likes gowns. Last thing is if you're married, have a spouse, bring your spouse with you. Okay? If they can do both visits, awesome. If, but they need to be at your report. 